Thanks for joining us here tonight with Jaskaran Dillon, Tammy Navarro, and Macarena Gomez Baris for a discussion around the politics and theory of climate change. A big thanks to Ashley Dawson for organizing this. A huge thanks to the panelists for speaking with us tonight. And thanks to the co-sponsors of the ongoing climate series we've been hosting at Verso. Social Text, Science for the People, 350.org, and Jacobin's The Dig podcast. The next event in the series is on Thursday, October 25th. It's called Migration in the Age of Climate Catastrophe and features Mimi Scheller, Tanu Yakupithiage, Nina Raul, and Ashley Dawson in a discussion on climate refugees, the politics of movement, and resisting the criminalization of immigrants. Um, just to note that copies of Macarena Gomez Barri's book, The Extractive Zone, are available here for purchase, and we also have beer and wine available for a $3 donation. Um, I'll quickly introduce the panelists and then turn things over to Maka to kick off the discussion. Um, Macarena Gomez Barris is chairperson of the Department of Social Science and Cultural Studies and director of the Global South Center at Pratt Institute. She is the author of three books, including The Extractive Zone, Social Ecologies and Decolonial Perspectives, which we have available here today, as well as Beyond the Pink Tide. She writes and teaches on social and cultural theory, decolonial thought, racial and extractive capitalism, and social movements. Jaskaran Dillon is a first-generation anti-colonial scholar and organizer who grew up on Treaty 6 Cree territory in Saskatchewan, Canada. Um, her first book, Prairie Rising, Indigenous Youth Decolonization and the Politics of Intervention from 2017, provides a critical ethnographic account of state interventions in the lives of urban indigenous youth. She is the co-editor, along with Nick Estes, of Standing with Standing Rock, Voices from the No Doppel Movement, forthcoming in 2019. Tammy Navarro is the associate director of the Bar Barnard Center for Research on Women, the founder of its Caribbean Feminisms on the Page Literary, S Literary Series, and co-founder of the collective Critical Caribbean Feminisms, which seeks to center critical engagements with Caribbean diasporic projects. Her work has been published in cult Cultural Anthropology, American Anthropologist, Small Axe Salon, The Caribbean Writer, and The Global South. She is currently at work on a manuscript entitled Virgin Capital, Financial Services as Development in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And now I'll turn it over to our panelists. Great, thank you. Is this working? Yes, okay, great. Um, thank you everyone for coming. It's great to see you all. What a lovely turnout. Uh, I'd like to thank Anne Wesley Verso and the Climate Action Lab, as well as Ashley Dawson, who couldn't be here tonight, but a sign of his generosity that he organized this panel anyway. Um, it's really an honor for me to be here alongside my colleagues, Jaskier and Dillon and Tammy Navarro, who are some of the leading thinkers on questions of debt, the African diaspora, indigenous struggles, um, and the future-oriented project of decolonization. I say future-oriented because we often think about a Bangdung moment, an earlier moment, a historical moment of decolonization, but to me, this is about decolonial futures and really engaging with that project. Collectively, our work contributes to shifting how we frame climate change and its devastating impacts by offering textured accounts of extractive racial and debt capitalism and the havoc it has wreaked closer? It's sounding so echoey. How's that? Okay, how's that? It's supposed to sound echoey. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> got it. So let me start that piece again, that our work really contributes to shifting the frame of climate change. I think we've each thought about the ways in which we don't necessarily jive with all of the um, ways in which climate change tends to frame so much, so we want to break some of that down. And we really want to say that extractive racial and debt capitalism and the havoc that's wreaked, especially upon indigenous and African populations um, for more than 500 years, matters. And that there's a particular way that we should conceptualize and think in relationship to those spaces. So here, kind of near and within the heart of Lenape territories and in this urban space of intense and overlapping histories of gentrification and tourism, it seems especially important to name climate change for what it is, right? The hydrocarbon avalanche that our billion high emitters economy has created. And it's also a persistent mindset that binds us, binds us together in the, uh, in the Americas globally, but also I'd like to suggest we can undo those particular toxic binds. <laughs> 
So what prompted the event today is an online dossier that we published for Social Text, which is called Beyond the Extractive View. So in order to explain that collaborative effort, I think I first have to say something about the research it's based upon. In my book, The Extractive Zone, Social Ecologies and Decolonial Perspectives, that came out last year with Duke University Press, I show how modes of perceiving the world are not a sidebar to political realities, but intimately shaped by our material and economic conditions. That is to say, decolonial, critical, indigenous art and aesthetics matter because they document the catastrophic pathway of extractive and racial capitalism. I can't say that point enough, right? That in fact, in those art spaces, in those geographies, we can find alternatives and we must look for them. They also show us modes of relating being in alternative systems that are not based upon competition or market-based solutions. Often we think about green capitalism or sustainability in this vein. We're trying to push beyond those kind of um, containers or even the myths of development and progress. Instead, they document devastation as well as collaborative solutions. And I would say that's something that in the dossier we're intent on looking at, not just kind of the path of destruction, right? So my book is not invested, really, in mere critique. Although there's a lot of that too. Um, after all, I was trained as a Marxist sociologist. I'll never be able to unveil myself of all of that training. But for my work, it's really about kind of crafting a perceptual method and foregrounding tra dramatic social transformation in the aftermath of environmental ruin. So let me be a little bit more specific um, about what I studied. I studied five regions of the Americas, including the Cusco Sacred Valley in uh, Peru, southwestern Cauca, Colombia, southern Bio Bio region in Chile, eastern Ecuador, and mining in a number of regions in Bolivia. And I study those regions to basically conclude that we have to pay attention to what is happening close to the ground. And from this term that I use a lot in the book, and I'm continuing to extend, from submerged perspectives. So the idea of actually seeing from below what that can bring to us in terms of you know, a different analytic, different kind of perceptual method. And also in relation to land and water defense within majority indigenous spaces, Again, in order to find meaningful solutions. I can't find, um, put it, find enough of a point on that. I'm now at an art institute, and solutions are really clarified there. That's some of our objectives. In a research one, we were never asked about solutions in terms of our um, you know, scholarly practice. So I would say you know, that staying close to the ground gives you something. It finds meaningful solutions to extractive capitalism's capacity to de-resource communities. That idea about what it means to actually de-resource communities. And it is through indigenous relationality or the aesthetics of extraction, and by working with, listening to, interviewing, and drafting with activist practitioners and artists, that the full catastrophe of what I'm calling extractive zones emerges. So whether it's petrol dependency and the toxic oil pools that dot the Amazonian basin, or the efforts at forest protection by Shuar and Quechua peoples, or the militant struggles for survival by Mapuche activists in the Bio Bio region, who are increasingly criminalized and imprisoned in the face of multinational pine and eucalyptus monoculture, or even as the Standing Rock protests against the Dakota pipeline are collectively etched in our memory. All of these dystopias that also contain within these utopic possibilities, I would suggest should haunt us. We should let them haunt us. They should push us to do more, and they should take us to task on finding solutions to the web of complicity and interdependency that are extractive zones. Now, I've sometimes been asked, well, is extractive zone about a place over there? And my answer is no, right? Um, it's not just in rural areas and biodiverse areas and eco pools um, and not just in terms of invisible spaces, but actually extractive zones touch us very, quite closely. So let me describe a little bit how that works. The extractive view, it turns out, is a dominant way of seeing the world, the land, and even each other. And it is ubiquitous. 
It organizes the academic factory that exhausts adjunct laboring bodies. It desources black and brown communities that, to invoke Ruthie Gilmore's phrasing, the state has abandoned. And it expands a prison industrial complex. The extractive and settler colonial view is at work in the opening of new resource frontiers based upon digital and military mapping. It also informs corporations that see land as there for the taking rather than as a site of indigenous histories. The extractive view produces amnesia over the violent history and consequences of colonialism. Now, because in my own area of work, Latin American monoculture dates back to silver and tin extraction in the early 16th century, and then depends upon sugar and oil to power the global economy, we must consider how capitalism in the Americas has long depended upon both indigenous as well as African descended labor. And we have a kind of split sometimes in academia and scholarly circles where there's a kind of binarized discussion between brown and black, indigenous and Afro-descended. I'm putting them together because the history is in fact together. In Energy Without Conscience, a book I just finished reading and I would recommend by David McDermott Hughes, he discusses how the first continual productive oil well indeed came from the deep petrol reserves in Trinidad. The island Columbus, of course, stepped foot on on his third voyage in 1498 to find Carib and Arawak populations that are now seen as, you know, the, the kind of target of genocide disappeared, et cetera, and there's a resurgence happening there. But of course, Trinidad is also the island of African enslaved labor and its transits, the geography that continues to possess some of the largest underground reserves anywhere. I don't think I realized that until recently. Um, in other words, the extractive view is a historical and racialized sightline of geographical exploitation. And sometimes we don't put those things together, but I'm trying to analytically make Make those connections. Okay, so let me take a breath. <laughs> um, in the few minutes I have tonight, it feels difficult, if not impossible, to summarize the eight years of research that went into this book. Um, it really does represent a kind of labor of love and you know, I doubt I'll do that kind of field work, rigorous field work again. Um, I hope I do, but it really did take a lot out of me as well. Um, I'd say that also because I talk about art and aesthetics, look at the images, look at the Periscope dossier because there's more online and images matter in this context when you're talking about visuality, aesthetics, et cetera. But really, my main objective with the book was to make the hemispheric and the global south connections visible as well as to argue for the centrality and the need for new imaginaries. Where did I find those imaginaries? I found them in videos. I found them in geo -choreographer, choreographies or performances to earth and with earth in collective spaces. I found them in street performances in daily life. I found them in social ecologies um, and in the courageous refusal of indigenous peoples. There are ar archives here um, for the future and Mapuche artist Francisco Wichegeo really taught me a lot about what it means to create an archive not just for now, not just for the tweet, not just for social media numbers, uh, for prizes or a hope of vast audiences. The first time he showed one of his films, he only had five people in the audience and I think only 40 people have seen that to date, maybe more after the book, hopefully. Um, but the point is he was documenting for future generations ways of seeing and experimenting beyond the extractive view. And that itself had a lot of value in it, okay? So let me turn then briefly to the online social text Periscope, which includes Tammy and Jaskiran's essay and also the work of art, other artists, activists, and scholars. Photographer, scholar, activist, Subhankar Banerjee, who will be here actually at Pratt very soon, his piece is entitled, Resisting the War on Alaska's Arctic with Multi-Species Justice. And it denounces the recent changes by the Trump administration to Arctic policy. Now for me, what's important there is centering the concept of multi-species justice. Banerjee moves beyond a simple invocation of human and non-human rights to another way to, respe to respect planetary life and to think about justice itself. So it's redefining all of those liberal conventions. It also moves us out of the nation state, which is really important to think about for a political moment. Multimedia artist Carolina Gaicedo writes about the hunger and the devastation in the wake of mega damming and hydroelectricity in Colombia.
working closely with anti-extractivist groups, groups like Asokimbo that you might have read about in the news because a lot of deaths have happened in those spaces, she uses environmental testimonials as a way to document multiple forms of indigenous repression, as well as the increased military patrolling and violence in areas of high biodiversity. Now, I say that term biodiversity, and I also want us to trouble that term, because isn't every space a highly biodiverse space? And what does it mean to actually acknowledge that and think from that episteme and logic? Adriana Garriga Lopez's work was another focal point of the dossier with her piece called The Other Puerto Rico. There she shows what the island's residents are currently doing in terms of sustainable food chains and supplies, as well as autonomous community organizing on the island, and refusing the terms given to them of disaster and military capitalism. And of course, this is really important, right? Tammy Navarro's essay focuses on the Virgin Islands and its historical representation as a vulnerable geography and as an unincorporated territory in the US's possession and firmly lodged within the matrix of coloniality. And I'm using Anibal Quijano's terminology there very deliberately because I think that's how you describe it even though you don't necessarily use that terminology. Um, for Navarro, fragments of porcelain art that are reassembled into Laval Bell's work become an important way to uncover the buried histories of the Caribbean, again, beyond the extractive view of calamity, debt, and foreign tourism that is often hoisted onto the representations of the islands. Navarro denounces the debt logics associated with the Virgin Islands and forces us to consider the layered and buried histories of survival where catastrophe has already struck. And that's, I think, another point of our panel. It's not that the apocalypse is coming. I think our research is already working in those spaces where catastrophe has come. And what does it mean to take seriously the kind of methods, the methodologies of being that continue survival in the aftermath of the apocalypse, right? We might do well to learn by these methods. Just Kieran Dillon's piece focuses on youth and indigenous organizing at Standing Rock to discuss chaos and entropy as strategies that worked against the coloniality of extractivism upon their territories. By lifting subjugated knowledges in their work, youth disorganize the logics of commodity capitalism that render indigenous peoples invisible. Instead, Dillon shows how indigenous youth organizers foreground relational modes of being in the world, and I'm sure we'll hear something more about that now. Indeed, the entire dossier is meant to offer critical strategies of resistance and refusal, and asks us to learn from those who live and die in the shadow of extractive capital, where oil drilling, the cutting off of local water supplies, where forced elimination, and the new technologies of mega extractivism, yes, it's a real thing happening all over the planet, um, have mostly ruined people's lives. One finding, then, is that we're not thinking just about the dynamics of colonialism and race aside from the Anthropocene. And you will find out soon that this panel frames the Anthropocene in really different ways. So I want to talk about that. Welcome. Come on in. You're OK. It's OK to come and sit down. Welcome in. OK. Not quite done, almost there. So let me just end my brief comments by situating myself and saying that we are holding this event a couple days after 9-11 at a date that for me mostly refers to the other 9-11 um, as a Chilean exile, etc. As you may know, on September 11th, 1973 was a day of the overthrow of President Allende by a military coup. The way the story usually goes is that Chile was irresponsible and voted socialist, and then big bad United States came in, and then big bad Pinochet took over. And all of that happened, but I have that kind of recurring traumatic question of why, right? Why, incessantly asking that question, historically, analytically, et cetera. So for me, we have to consider the colonial history of copper the resource that Spain, the US, and Britain all clamored for during different phases of the global economy. Copper, it turns out, now powers the digital economy for its superior conductivity. It is used in the world's most powerful and resource-intensive computers. 
Understanding the climate mess we are also in means that we actually have to analyze how the paradigm of war, perhaps, has always been one of extraction. So thank you for listening. So just to tell you a little bit how we'll run this, um, I'm going to turn now to just gear in, then Tammy will present, and then we'll have some dialogue between us of some questions that we've already discussed, and then we'll open up for comments and questions from you all. Okay? So thank you, just gear in. Great. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Great. I'll try to talk as closely into the mic as I can. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, so hi everyone, it's great to see such an awesome crowd and a special shout out to all my new school students who are here, so thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and future students, potentially. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'd like to thank Macarena for inviting me to be part of this panel discussion today and Tammy for um, her important and essential work that she'll be sharing with you shortly, which I think is really um, relevant in the moment as the hurricane's approaching and we're thinking about these questions. Um, and all the folks at Verso for hosting this event and doing all the labor and behind the scenes organizing to make it happen. So thank you, even though I don't know all of your names. Um, and I'd also like to begin by acknowledging that we're here in New York City on the ancestral homelands of the Lenape people. Um, I'll also start quickly by saying that I'm approaching this brief commentary from my vantage point as an anti-colonial scholar and organizer and as someone who is committed to fostering the connections between scholarship and political organizing and action. So I was asked to provide some brief commentary that highlights my current research, part of which served as the impetus for my contributions to the social text periscope orchestrated by Maka that she just spoke about. So we can all probably agree, or my guess is that we wouldn't be here, that we live in a time almost singularly defined by climate change, with growing resistance to environmental degradation and extractive industries burgeoning across the globe. In the midst of this planet-wide crisis, riddled with uncritical and often homogenizing debates about the Anthropocene, which we'll talk about a little bit during the um, discussion between the three of us, indigenous peoples have been at the forefront of environmental justice movements. My ethnographic research enters this broader landscape with a specific interest in exploring the political organizing efforts of indigenous youth in this global movement across three different sites. The Standing Rock Sioux Reservation in North Dakota here in the United States, um, or what is now known as the United States, Ratanakiri, Cambodia, and North Sikkim, India. Tentatively titled Resurgence, Resistance, and Anti-Colonial Youth Politics in Global Environmental Justice, this work has sprung from my growing interest in issues of climate change and my long-standing work with indigenous communities and youth specifically, many of whom have been involved in resistance efforts against extractive projects. Situated at the intersection of precarity and possibility, indigenous youth are makers of something I'm beginning to interpret as anti-colonial entropy, a networked set of ideas, beliefs, and organizing efforts crucial to fostering a political condition of decolonial disorder in our current reality of racial capitalism intimately bound up with the extractive industries as Maka spoke about, and I'm sure Tammy will too, violent state sovereignty, and a persistent avowal of present future where colonial power reigns supreme. Anti-colonial entropy as orchestrated by indigenous youth promotes De degradation of the social and political infrastructure necessary to sustain colonial societies. And of course, that social and political infrastructure is what builds the physical infrastructure and all of the development and extractive projects that we see in uh, um, global racial capitalism's wake. So it is necessarily unsetting, unsettling, anti-hegemonic, and anchored to the political goal of liberation and freedom. So in many ways, I envision this research and the subsequent organizing efforts attached to it, because I try not to think of myself solely as a, as a scholar and a researcher, but as somebody that's actively engaged in political, political organizing efforts, as an interruption of the way indigenous youth have been narrowly portrayed as passive recipients of a colonial project, and as an avenue to bring visibility to their imaginative power in the face of remarkable challenges posed by the persistence of colonial violence as experienced differentially in the three sites. Um, so these are some of the submerged perspectives that Maka was speaking of. <laughs> 
This research, I would argue, however, is also important because it has the potential to serve as a platform from which we can begin to understand the complex linkages among colonialism, racial capitalism, and environmental devastation. These ideas are often not brought together in environmental studies programs, and to understand them specifically from the vantage point of young people that are inheriting a particular kind of social and political order and environmental ruin. And again, Tammy and Maka take these, up, these linkages up in their own work too. So despite the tidal wave of interest from scientists and environmental advocates indigenous in indigenous knowledges about the land, water, and sky that, that has emerged amidst debates about saving our home, and I say that in parentheses, limited attempts have been made to theorize how conquest and persistent settler colonial violence necessarily factor into debates over climate crisis and over environmental crisis and climate change. This despite the creation of territories of material and psychic abandonment, largely fueled by histories of colonial violence and their contemporary manifestations. Indeed, part of the work of this project is to think across different geographical locations to consider how decolonization emerges through environmental resistance efforts led by indigenous youth across the globe and to determine how they may, may be producing and are producing new forms of revolutionary pushback that are not immediately legible as political or as organizing efforts. Some of the lines of inquiry thus include, how can a contemporary envir environmental disaster be first and foremost positioned as a form, a longstanding form of colonial violence deeply interwoven with dispossession and marginalization? How are indigenous youth creatively resisting ongoing forms of colonial violence as enacted through environmental devastation? What can be learned about the possibilities for a transnational movement for decolonization through a comparative analysis of indigenous youth organizing efforts in these sites? So let me spend a few minutes now offering a bit more detail about these three sites. The first right, site, Standing Rock, North Dakota, serves as an exemplary case in the sense that the mobilization against the Dakota Access Pipeline clearly showcases the political leadership of indigenous youth. The research that I've conducted here served as the basis for my piece in the series of social texts where I outline how the ecologies of decolonial, decolonial organizing spearheaded by indigenous youth centered on bringing subjugated knowledges forward and elevating silence narratives about contemporary native life. They also focus on embodied ways of being in relation to one another as humans existing amongst and within an other than human world. So this is, again, a multi-species lens that centers interconnections and a set of relations. So us as participating in a set of relations where inter um, interconnection, accountability um, are paramount. And they're also demanding a future that is accountable to them and the generations yet to be born. This sentiment was beautifully captured in an interview I conducted with LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, founder of the Sacred Stone Camp. When I asked about the role of youth at Standing Rock, she told me, quote, when things started happening at, against Dapple, it was the youth who ran the chants, the youth who ran the marches, and the youth that followed. We have to listen to them. They are fighting for the right to live. They are fighting for the right to have water. They are fighting for their future. They are fighting for their children, for what comes next. I believe these young people stood up to heal a nation and that's what I see them doing. So it is and has always been them and their words. There is power in these youth. There is prayer and ceremony in what they speak. When they speak, they speak the truth." End quote. Through their organizing efforts, indigenous youth at Standing Rock consistently demonstrated that the struggle against the Dakota Access Pipeline was also a struggle against the violent materialism of what it means to live and breathe, to exist within colonial system structures, within occupation, and that these experiences are intergenerational, moving back and forth in time. The second site, Ratanakiri, Cambodia, stands as a clear signpost of China's international push to acquire minerals, fossil fuels, agricultural commodities, and timber from a variety of states. Across the globe, on nearly every continent, China is involved in a dizzying variety of resource extraction, energy, agricultural, and infrastructure projects, roads, railways, hydropower dams, mines that are wreaking unprecedented damage to ecosystems and biodiversity. Concerns over China's presence in Cambodia have been expressed by indigenous peoples who are on the front lines of halting rampant deforestation, land grabbing, illegal logging, and the granting of mining concessions. 
in the remote province of Ratanakiri, which is in the northeastern part of Cambodia, right on the border with Vietnam, where I'm conducting my field work, indigenous communities are making visible the impacts of climate change that have already drastically altered their livelihoods and ways of living, and indigenous youth are, once again, central to these organizing efforts. They are calling attention to the contamination of food and water sources caused by development projects that have come alongside China's presence in Cambodia, projects that are often positioned by the Cambodian government as beneficial for the economic prosperity of the country. And these logics are also seen in places like the United States and Canada, where economic prosperity becomes tied to national security and questions of sovereignty, and then the militarized response when those things don't go as you want them to go. Lack of rainfalls created dire conditions in a country where 80% of the population relies on agriculture. My third site of research is North Sikkim, India, where Lepcha indigenous youth went on a hunger strike about 10 years ago, ago to protest the Indian Power Ministry's plan to develop seven hydroelectric dams as a mean to in, means to increase energy production in the Himalayan states. Citing the failure of the Indian government to foster employment opportunities in a country beset by endemic poverty and deprivation, where indigenous, these indigenous youth were critically questioning a state-directed development agenda that does not serve the interests of the community. They were able to gar garner enough international attention that four out of the seven hydroelectric projects were canceled, and I really encourage you to look at the work of M Mabel Gergen on this. Um, but their organizing efforts continue, and I'm really eager to look deeply at how these young people make sense of their resistance as part of a global anti-colonial movement that finds its footing in questions of environmental justice. And this is really new for me. I just spent a good portion of the summer in India, so it's a, um, an area of work that I'm really just beginning to, to dig into and develop. But it is my contention that these young people offer us new ways of seeing and understanding the politics of climate change, as well as offering possibilities for radical resistance that are embedded within context, history, and place. To put it succinctly, as I say in the conclusion of my piece for social texts, indigenous youth are the critical mass threading together and sustaining the anti-colonial entropy necessary for revolutionary liberation that will bring forth alternative forms of existence on the planet. In doing so, their bravery and brilliance should compel all of us to ask ourselves what we are willing to fight for. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. How's this? Good? Okay. Thank you so much. I just want to echo, um, can this be lowered in any way? No? Oh, just this one. Okay. Um, I just want to echo the thanks that have gone around um, and say how grateful I am to be part of this conversation and how much I appreciated um, the written correspondence that we had through the Periscope and how productive it has been. The piece that I have as part of the written record in the Periscope really um, comes out of my primary research, which is on uh, racialized capitalism in the U.S. Virgin Islands, and I'm looking at uh, an offshore banking program um, and making sense of that through a longer history of racialized capitalism. The remarks I'm going to give tonight always already reference that, um, but given the moment that we're in, having this conversation about environmental ruin as a hurricane unfolds an hour south of us, um, I'm going to be speaking about the ongoing crisis in the U.S. Virgin Islands nearly a year to the day after we were struck by two massive hurricanes. So. On September 19th, 2017, residents of St. Croix, the largest of the three U.S. Virgin Islands, were frenzied, buying water and batteries, hammering storm shutters and plywood over exposed glass on their homes, and gathering what news they could. All this was in preparation for landfall of Hurricane Maria, a Category 5 hurricane that was on course to hit the island within hours. Never mind that the island and its fellow Virgin Islands of St. Thomas and St. John had borne the brunt of another Category 5 storm, Irma, just days before. At any rate, in the wake of this frenzied activity to secure property and life, I received a text message from my next-door neighbor on St. Croix, Yolanda. A praying woman, she had attended to those preparations, yes, but now she turned her attention to more grounded matters the questions of after the storm. What, she wondered, would become of her and her fellow residents of St. Croix. 
So as the winds of Hurricane Maria began to bear down and she feared for the fate of her roof, she sent me a final text message. Quote, the governor says we will be months without power and I am pretty sure the government priority will be St. Thomas, the seat of government, end quote. So in my brief comments, I take seriously the provocation we, we got to engage with the title Ways of Seeing and take up Yolanda's comment and those like it that emerged from St. Croix in the days before and after Hurricane Maria. On its face, this concern with the quotidian intra-island politics seems odd on the brink of potentially catastrophic damage. However, viewed through a different lens, another way of seeing emerges, of taking into account a century of existing as an American territory and being only selectively included under this banner, and a longstanding frustration at being overshadowed by its more prosperous neighbor, St. Thomas. So to shed light on the unique situation of the US Virgin Islands, particularly St. Croix, vis-a-vis -vis its political positioning and the threat of environmental ruin, I've divided my remarks into two short categories. The first, America's Paradise, takes up the status of these islands as an unincorporated territory that is possession of the United States, as Maka gestured to in her opening remarks. The second short section, Environmental Ruin, addresses the implications of climate change for small islands in the Caribbean and the increasing likelihood of record-breaking storms for these precariously positioned small places. So a few words on America's Paradise. The year 2017 marked the 100th anniversary of the islands now known as the United States Virgin Islands, formerly the Danish West Indies, existing as a possession of the United States. In March 1917, the US purchased these islands, St. Croix, St. Thomas, St. John, from Denmark for 25 million US dollars. So in celebration of this milestone, this 100th anniversary in 2017, a number of commemorations and celebrations were held, both in Denmark and across the territory. At one such celebration on St. Croix in March 2017, U.S. Secretary of the Interior Ryan Zinke attended and lauded Virgin Islanders as model American citizens, saying, quote, today is a testament to the Virgin Islanders whose commitment, vision, expertise, and sacrifice built these islands, enriched our shared history, and contributed to our national security. Since joining the American family, Virgin Islanders have distinguished themselves, end quote. Just six months later, American news outlets would fret about Hurricane Irma making landfall in the United States, that is Florida, while eliding entirely the damage done to the US-owned Virgin Islands, in particular, St. Thomas and St. John, that were directly in the path of the Category 5 storm. <clears throat> this juxtaposition of the celebration of the Virgin Islands' inclusion in the United States and its subsequent exclusion shortly thereafter is striking, yet these events merely illuminate the ways in which the USVI has been selectively included in and positioned outside of the United States since its purchase. In the years immediately following its purchase, the islands were administered by the US Navy, marking their role as a useful military acquisition, with American citizenship being extended to these islands' residents fully a decade later, with their transfer to civil administration under the Department of the Interior. Caribbeanist uh, scholar Isaac Dukin has written of these islands purchase for their strategic military potential, potential which was ultimately never fulfilled following World War I, and argues that this failed potential, this unfulfilled potential, has, quote, determined the political attitude of the United States to its uh, newly acquired territory. End quote. So they never became what they were meant to be, right? So they've existed in this sort of limbo ever since. The flat-footed response of the United States to the damage wrought by Hurricanes Irma and Maria demonstrate, I argue, the ways in which this political attitude of ambivalence toward their possessions in the Caribbean continues in the present moment. For instance, in the wake of the devastating damage wrought by these storms, the, the United States seemingly doubled down on the liminality of the USVI, with US President Donald Trump refusing to visit the ravaged islands to assess damage, and instead meeting with the territory's governor aboard an, a military, uh, aboard an American military ship off the coast of Puerto Rico. What is more, in the aftermath of these storms, 
Residents of St. Croix have articulated a claim of being largely unseen and overlooked, both in relation to the larger island of Puerto Rico, which received far more coverage on American news outlets than did the Virgin Islands, and in relation to their sister island of St. Thomas. So some of this frustration is the result of the uninformed response of the US to its territory. That is the seeming lack of awareness of the vast difference between these islands, right? So they're lumped together as a territory. This obliviousness is demonstrated most clearly perhaps by US President Trump's claim that in surveying the storm damage, he had, quote, met with the president of the Virgin Islands, end quote. An unusual claim as he himself is the president of the Virgin Islands. <laughs> He meant, it later became clear, that he had met with the governor of these islands, Kenneth Mapp. However, it's this lack of familiarity with the Virgin Islands as a whole, as an entity, not to mention the varied conditions across these islands that have frustrated really desperate, um, disaster-stricken Virgin Islanders. So for instance, St. Thomas has long been the most economically successful of the three, featuring prominently on many cruise ship and tour group itineraries. For purposes, and this is just a sort of primer on the USBI, for purposes of legislation and marketing, the tiny uh, 20 square mile island of St. John, which is almost entirely decimated by Hurricane Irma, um, is often grouped together with St. Thomas as something of an awkward appendage to St. Thomas, a relationship that has contributed to intra-territorial tensions around autonomy in the context of American imperialism. St. Croix, however, has long had difficulty penetrating tourist networks and has been the US Virgin Island most in need of economic intervention. After a number of unsuccessful attempts at economic development, including uh, crude oil processing, aluminum manufacturing, and broader industrialization attempts, local and federal legislators worked together in the early 2000s to create a tax holiday program that turned to the American financial market as the driver of St. Croix's economy. And that intervention uh, forms the basis of my work, which I think we'll talk about a little bit in the Q&A. Um, in a very different context, I have written about the cultivation of precarity in the name of profitability. And I'd like to extend that framing here, as St. Croix has been constructed as a vulnerable space that has experienced widespread economic precarity a reality which has only come into sharper focus in the wake of hurricanes Irma and Maria. The conditions on the ground in the USVI were appalling and the islands barely inhabitable after these storms with food shortages, a widespread and months long blackout and daily competitions for necessary and limited commodities like water and gasoline to power generators, machines which were themselves in extremely short supply in the months following the storms. The extensive damage on the ground, roofs in the middle of once busy intersections, trees leaning precariously over pedestrian walkways speak volumes about the exclusion of these islands from the US national imagination and the willingness of American elected officials to turn a blind eye to the daily struggle for survival taking place in an ostensibly American space. While much of the Caribbean was pummeled by these natural disasters, I don't mean to <clears throat> to single out the, these islands in particular, what has outraged Virgin Islanders and those on St. Croix in particular is the sense of being excluded by the United States and having their suffering overlooked by the country that regularly touts these islands as America's paradise in tourism campaigns. So a few short comments on environmental ruin and then I'll close. <clears throat> Hurricanes are measured by the Saphir Simpson scale which record storms from category one, ranging from 74 to 95 miles per hour through category five, a designation for storms whose winds reach 157 miles per hour or higher. This highest category designates storms that will cause catastrophic damage. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, NOAA, outlines the damage to be expected as a result of category five storms, quote, a high percentage of framed homes will be destroyed with total roof failure and wall collapse. Fallen trees and power poles will isolate residential areas. Power outages will last for weeks to months. Most of the area will be uninhabitable for weeks or months." End quote. At its height, Hurricane Irma included winds of 185 miles per hour, 
I'm trained as an anthropologist, so by way of ethnographic positioning, it bears mentioning that I was born and raised on St. Croix and lived through the last Category 5 hurricane to hit that island, Hurricane Hugo, in 1989. As such, I reflect on these more recent storms with embodied memories of violent winds, being evacuated from a room as a roof fell victim to the storm, existing for months without electricity, and of course surviving on US military provided MREs, or meals ready to eat. Famously beige colored packages of freeze dried rations that were the only food available in the aftermath of Hurricane Hugo. In many ways, it has taken the better part of the intervening three decades for St. Croix to recover from the devastation of that storm. The near simultaneous occurrence of two such record storms necessitates both reflection and action. <clears throat> In her work on gender equity and climate change, Mariama Williams points to the particular burdens borne by the Caribbean region vis-a-vis -vis climate change, including coral bleaching, decrease marine life and aquaculture. And now I'm gonna talk numbers a little bit beyond this. Williams notes that, quote, sea level rise alone is estimated to have an annual cost of 41 million US dollars, which is approximately 4% of the Caribbean region's GDP. A 2016 United Nations report on food and agriculture found that between 1970 and 2000, the Caribbean region suffered direct and indirect losses estimated between 700 million and 3.3 billion US dollars due to natural disasters associated with weather and climate events. In the wake of climate change, catastrophic storms are only becoming more common. While much of the US government rem remains embroiled in a debate over Earth's warming, the occurrence of these major storms points to a changed landscape of weather-related possibilities moving forward. So just a few words in closing. Nearly a year to the day has passed since hurricanes Maria and Irma ravaged the US Virgin Islands and conditions on the ground have not markedly improved despite the extensive presence of American functionaries, FEMA workers, and US-based independent contractors. Beyond ongoing material difficulties, the psychological toll of existing in a crisis zone for the better part of a year and by the way, being in the midst of a new hurricane season at this moment is impossible to estimate. In the wake of a catastrophic hurricane, there's the immediate aftermath in which mattresses must be aired, electronics discarded, and tarps installed. As the weeks wear on, however, the longer term effects of surviving disaster begin to come into focus. The, the Sisyphean attempts to adopt to the loss of livelihood and the gutting of the local community as many residents flee the island for the relative safety of the US mainland. This reaction to post-hurricane life, this exodus of sorts, again demonstrates the complexity of the awkward status occupied by the US Virgin Islands vis-a-vis -vis the United States. While the conditions of squalor have been largely ignored by the US media and elected officials, Virgin Islanders have the opportunity to migrate to the US mainland an option that is uncommon and high, often highly desirable in the Caribbean. While the US Virgin Islands remains in dire need of resources, including books for students who have lost the progress of an academic year to split sessions, right? So they go to school from nine to 12 or 12 to three because most of the public schools have been uh, condemned. So uh, books, they're in need of books. They're in need of funding for after-school programs, as after-school hours now run from noon until dusk, as well as perishable goods. What is most needed now is attention to the continuing crisis of shortages, including food, water, roofing materials, the ongoing blackouts, and deep concern about being able to survive the current hurricane season with hundreds of so-called blue roofs that is, plastic tarpaulins as their only protection from the elements. The residents of America's vacation destination, America's paradise, need the US to engage with its territory in this moment of ongoing and unfolding crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Jess Kieran and Tammy, for those presentations. That was a lot to think about and work with. And 
We did talk ahead a little bit about what might be productive and generative to think together, think with you about. Um, I was really struck in, I, I didn't read the presentations ahead of time, um, but as we were languaging our work, I was really struck by you know, the ways in which we were writing, thinking, the language we were using. So the minor, the small, the quotidian, the island, the precarious vulnerability, embodied memory, Questions of the invisible came up a lot in Tammy's work. Um, in Jess Guerin, there was attention to the project of liberation, the struggle for freedom, the anti-colonial. And really, the language shows a kind of stakes in political project, a kind of political stakes, um, embodied stakes, political stakes. And the question I was really wanting to pursue is how our own work that's invested in thinking about environmental ruins, um, you know, and the Anthropocene, which I think a lot of our writing is working against um, in some ways, what, does, what are the other you know, um, epistemes that we're working with? Are they women of color feminisms? Are they black feminisms? What are, are they indigenous um, you know, narratives and perspectives? Is storytelling mattering? I can tell that there's common threads working here and that these submerged perspectives are really not just animating the work, but how you even communicate the work. So I don't know if you wanted to address either of you that question. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I just finished talking, so I'll keep going. Okay. Um, is it? Is it? Yeah, this is fine. Yeah. Thank you for that question. For me, the the kind of framing or, or what I think with most productively um, is is the history of feminism that has been done by Black women, um, and particularly with this. The notion of, I mean, this is a, it's a complicated thing because it's become a buzzword that has been dismissed, this intersectionality, but really thinking through the positioning, right? So if I'm thinking of a space um, that has its geopolitical positioning as central, right? So it exists as a territory of the United States, that's impossible for me to engage with or apprehend its, its current vulnerable environmental situation without taking into account the ways this came to be, which are racism and which are gender-based violence, right? Which are all come out of the beginning of um, capitalism in this space, the plantation um, economy, right? So intersectionally, not intersectionality, not in a sort of throwaway buzzword way, but really thinking about what are the multiple forms of oppression and ways of existing that come together, right? Um, in this moment and in these spaces, and how can we look to that, again, intersectionality as the impetus for a new future, right? How can we think together um, as a complex, maybe unexpected set of collectives um, to think about how we fight these historical and ongoing processes? Does that make sense? But of course, it's really difficult to do that in our work because oftentimes the universal concepts and categories carry more weight are valued differentially, are seen as, you know, um, you know, working with the minor is more difficult in a lot of ways. And I heard in your work, Tammy, a lot of lifting of um, oral histories and interviews and also in Jess Gearing's work. And I think sometimes we get punished for actually working from decolonial perspectives and centering kind of gender and sexuality. Even the naming of Hurricane Maria, Hurricane Irma, you know, these, these kind of ways in which these logics operate. So I don't know if you wanted to also address that, just Gary. Um, yeah, I'll just say a few things. So I think it's somewhat evident from my presentation that um, I'm interested and invested in bringing an anti-colonial critique of the politics of climate change and environmental justice. And that means that I'm often drawing on the work of scholars that are not, don't have a, a great, um, uh, a presence in environmental studies and in much of the work that's been done on the Anthropocene. I remember when I first started being interested in taking up questions of climate change from a critical perspective and I kept reading all this, Anthropocene kept coming up over and over again in the anthropology databases and other databases, but none of the work was actually critical. So I kept thinking to myself, where are the critiques around disproportionate impact? Where are the critiques around the linkages between racial capitalism and colonialism and environmental devastation? Why is this being presented as 
a problem that is only um, located in the moment. So to, where's the long-standing history of environmental devastation that has come since the, the point of first contact, if we're speaking just about indigenous North America? And so for me, the work um, that's been emerging from critical indigenous studies from in the black radical tradition that is sort of grounded in ways of understanding um, and, and privileging, I think, experiential knowledge, knowledge, grounded perspectives, embodied perspectives, really thinking about who exists on the front lines of these experiences. What, what, is, what is their relationship to these big circulating theories and ideas about climate change? And what are we missing when we're teaching our students in our classes about these issues, right? And, and so for me, I think there have been some of the most um, those fields, uh, and, and there's obviously huge bodies of literature associated with both of them, but have been central, and obviously like global critiques of um, global capitalism that are written by feminists in the global south have been extremely helpful, um, but I would also agree with Maka, and I'm sure Tammy to some degree also has this experience that these are not the dominant modes of understanding and making sense of the politics of climate change. So what I'm really excited about is that we're here having this public dialogue where we're actually shifting the way that we, you know, think about this in the public imaginary and, you know, because we're kind of working against it, also a kind of epistemic violence. Yeah, I want to say too, I found your comment, Jessica Rohn, when you were talking about inverting the relationship of power. So instead of thinking about these processes of violence as something that only and always happens to these youth activists, yeah. right? That they are that there's a sort of agency there that they respond to it certainly, but that they have a that there's a, a dynamic there, and that for me is the one of the central interventions of citing in the ways that I do. So having the ethnography, having the interviews, right? So when I'm writing about um, unfolding processes of global capitalism, that that's a sort of um, meta discourse, but to, to my mind and my experience, it is the embodied grounded actors, right? That facilitate and that enable that to happen. So they're not just sort of being gobbled up, although they're being certainly dispossessed in really problematic ways, but the, that they are people that are positioned and those positionings build on particularly particular histories of place, of, of, of encounters. Um, and that matters, that those stories matter not because they're interesting or not because they're, you know, they add color, but because that is the real story, in my case anyway, of unfolding global capitalism, that people are positioned in particular ways to make it more possible for things to unfold um, in particular places. So there's a reason that out of the way places, right, become colonies. There's a reason that people look the way they do who are colonized, right, and that that history continues. And if there's anything I wanna do is, is to echo what Maka's saying about extending the temporality, right? It's not the sort of past moment of, well, we had decolonial, particularly in the Caribbean, we had this independence movement, decolonialism in the 60s and 70s. No, that it's a ongoing set of processes um, with which we're, we continue to be bound up. Rich, and there's a lot to discuss there, but I think I, what I want to do is extend your point, Tammy, around the politics of citation, because I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of confusion right now about what it means to actually do a certain kind of political work through your citational practice. Mm -hmm. And I know in my own work in the extractive zone, I almost exclusively cited scholars of color, worked with texts that were within a transnational framework, tried to think comparatively, tried to raise and lift the voices of indigenous peoples, try to do some work around translation. Of course, all of that work takes a lot more time, especially the work of translation, um, which is tireless. There's not much resources for it. Duke, as wonderful as they are, um, you know, there's not even resources there to really think about that, although we're trying to push Duke in that direction and in other places, um, certainly there are, but it is difficult to do that work. And I think one of the things that I've noticed too is that, um, you know, you have to have certain anchoring points, so there are kind of some references there. But then when you take it to the next level, when you actually see your informants as um, you know, you're citing them as a theory makers. You're citing artists as a theory makers. You're moving art not in just as to kind of, again, set the secondary order, but central to the process of theory making. The voices of young activists is central. Um, to me, working at those intersections has been really enlivening, you know, uh, activist practitioner work, artist scholarship, and getting out of the kind of anti-intellectual mode, but at the same time thinking um, that thinking, being, doing, making can actually happen together. So I'm just, all that to say, 
is there anything you'd like to say about you know, what we can take from this work and actually provide other, other streams, other avenues, other decolonial futures even, um, that actually lead us to, to something that's of critical hope rather than just devastation. Um, so I will say that um, I'm totally with you on the citational politics, both of you, and how we're thinking about the sort of important work that we have to do around curriculum and citation practices, and um, I think that it's central to how we're, it's central to how we even imagine and think about building an analysis and supporting not just the work that we do as comrades, but also the next sort of rising generation that are also working on these issues. So I think it's like absolutely crucial that we're really um, attentive to who we talk about and whose stories, because as Tammy was mentioning, and I teach Maka's book, you know, so I've had the experience of seeing what, that hap what happens with that in a classroom, this tells you a different story about power right, which you can't talk about climate change without talking about power, and right, power is always racialized, power always has gender dynamics and class dynamics, and this is like, should be really, you know, should be, in my view, at the center of, of how we're taking up questions of environmental crisis. Um, and for me, I think that one of the most um, important aspects of doing this kind of work is that it also pushes you outside of thinking out of, pushing you away from sort of centering the state and also thinking outside the formal political systems of change. Like it is really shocking to me how many uh, people I encounter that, are, that still believe that the kind of political and change that we need to sort of alter the trajectory of climate change is gonna be found in Washington, DC. You know, and so I think it you allows you to see possibility through the eyes of young people and people that are actually on the front lines of forging new territory, of thinking about new possibilities. And so I think you know, it helps you develop your own imaginary. You think about things that you never would have thought about before, and that for me is like, and that also enlists a different kind of accountability to the future. And that makes me excited. It makes me feel like I can look my children, my daughters in the face and say, like, I'm actually trying to think outside of the systems that have got us here, you know, and to work with them and alongside them. Um, yeah, and I see so much amazing solidarity work, even at Standing Rock, between you know black youth and native youth and um, people that are doing work on Palestine, that you see how these transnational connections and this architecture of comparative um, analysis is really important. Yeah. Thank you. I will say, I'll maybe try to combine um, the, the two questions on, on sort of how we position ourselves, citational practices, with, who, with whom do we imagine ourselves in conversation, right? Who are the interlocutors? As well as trying to think about this question of hope that, that you point us toward. Um, so for me, I work in a, in a very small region. The Caribbean is not geographically large, but it's incredibly linguistically diverse, right? So you can have English speaking right next to Spanish speaking, and there's French, and there's Dutch. And it's, it's really to our detriment, because the histories and the processes often unfold in such similar ways, but we don't talk to each other to nearly as much as we ought to, right? Um, because again, of the, the practicalities of life, of translation, of, of getting into those archives, of having those materials available to us. Um, but one thing that has been really um, amazing to me in the wake, and again, in the last 12 months since we've had these hurricanes, is the kind of solidarity that I've seen come out because of <clears throat> moving away from this sort of emphasis on the nation state. So I dwelt a lot on, on taking the United States to task in my remarks, but these, uh, environmental happenings, let's call them, um, aren't concerned with what flag you operate under, right? So what I have seen happen is solidarity with folks from the U.S. Virgin Islands and the neighboring British islands and folks from Guadeloupe. And what have sprung up are amazing networks of sharing, of barter, right? In the absence of formalized economy for a long time, there's no light, there's no money, you can't go to the ATM. Um, the new possibilities that are old in some ways, right? But have a sense of collectivity across space, across physical space has emerged um, in ways that I had not previously um, experienced. So that, to me, has been surprising and encouraging to think about how people, in some ways, are forced to and become creative in response to, to the absenting of um, the ways in which we're used to living and imagining ourselves. Well, for me, what's really refreshing in hearing your responses is that there is a sense of enlivened future. <laughs> um, that's not something, you know, when you talk about this topic, uh, 
a lot of the evidence and the quantitative mobilization of research can lead you in a different directionality. Um, and I think we're trying to suggest that actually we see something else happening, and we see it with a lot of texture uh, in, in the spaces that we study, and we want to communicate, I think, that, um, that you know, those alternatives and those possibilities and those excitements really about something else. Um, and I think it is beyond the nation state. I think it's both of you said at different times. So with that said, um, I just want to wonder if, if there are audiences, burning questions, opportunities from, from you all to actually address some of what's been said. I see a couple of hands. Two questions before they uh, respond to them. Uh, well, that was really loud, sorry. <laughs> so, Jaskaran, this is um, more a question for you. Um, I'm interested because I'm from Canada. So, <laughs> I was curious, um, I know you said you, we need to move away from these like centers of institutionalized power, um, but they still exist, and so, and they have a huge role to play in our lives. Um, and I wonder if you find it troubling that, um, the legal system, the courts seem to be listening to indigenous voices uh, in Canada more than the government, um, the government which is liberal and purports to desire indigenous reconciliation, uh, desires to promote multiculturalism and environmentalism and has all these isms that it on the surface seems to be promoting. Um, and yet, you know, wants to force through the Trans Mountain Pipeline, wants to force through all these extractive projects. Um, and so that should be theoretically a more progressive institution than a court, which is a more conservative institution. Are you troubled by this sense that we're moving maybe backwards um, or that there's not a clear space for activists to be working in the political system at all? Hello. Uh, um, first of all, that uh, that was really amazing. I cannot overstate just how inspiring and generative and, and productive that was. Um, so thank you. Uh, I was thinking a lot while you were talking about racial capitalism and Ruthie Gilmore's definition of racism as group differentiated exposure to premature death. Um, and I was thinking about this morning, there's this news of Donald Trump denying the number of people who are, uh, who have died after the uh, in Puerto Rico, and I was, I've been thinking about the way that denying or invisibilizing death and premature death is, is also a way of denying or invisibilizing the fact of racism and the, the systemic nature of racism. But I was also thinking about the, the, the tension with the politics of displaying and objectifying black death, and I, I just kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on, on that kind of complicated politics of, of, of how to think about death um, in that context. Thank you. Hi. Um, so this is a question from Angarena. Can you speak a little bit more about this idea of the extractive view, not as a practice um, or as a zone, but also as a way of seeing the world? Hi, um, thank you. Um, you guys stressed the youth-centered aspect of this, and there's often this generational narrative in the United States, say, where it's this idea of like older people screwing over the future generations or whatever. Um, so I was hoping you could comment on sort of the generational stuff going on in your field work, whether this type of activism and the aesthetic work as well is providing a sort of rupture with the past or rather a sense of continuity because you also stress the sort of historical roots of all of this. So I was, just was wondering how in all these different places people are relating to their grandparents or whatever, you know? cognizant that this is a hot room, it's a full room, yeah. so we don't want to keep you too long, but let's do this round. Of 
guess I'll, I'll take a stab at answering this first question about Canada. And um, so I guess I'll just start by saying, and I'll, I'll try to keep this brief given we have a lot to talk about, that the legal system is also f part of the formal political system in the country, right? So it's an arm of the state um, constructed with a very specific kind of colonial agenda, right? The Indian Act also came out of the legal system in Canada. Um, and so what I will say about this is that I think that we need to be working on all fronts. So I'm certainly not advocating a full, you know, abandonment of state institutions where people are actively working through a kind of affirmative sabotage from the inside, right, in Spivak's terms, how we're thinking about, you know, engaging the politics of disruption. Um, but I do think that there is, and I talk about this a little bit in my book, Prairie Rising, about this kind of inside out, inside, outside in and inside out, how you think about what is possible when you work outside of state systems? And incredible things are actually happening all over the world with no funding from foundations, with no political um, investment from local governments. Um, and so I think it's important that you hold those things in tension and that we pay attention to the kinds of stories, submerged perspectives, grounded perspectives that are coming from places that you don't normally look. Um, so, you know, I'm not surprised that, you know, the Canadian government bought a pipeline. Right, because if you look at the history of Canadian, you know, the Canadian sort of federal government's approach to quote unquote the Indian problem, it's always been about extraction. It's always been about management. It's always been about elimination. So maybe I'll just offer a few um, words in in, um, in answer or conversation um, with your earlier question. I think you know, in short, it's complicated. Um, so clearly, I am not in support of Donald Trump nor his. Um, the alternative facts, right? The largest inauguration in history. But that's a sort of far end of the spectrum. And I think that there's a less disingenuous way to come up with a different set of numbers, right? And this can be the problem of um, the quantitative. So if you say how many people died during the hurricane, what does that mean, right? Does that mean how many people were struck by debris? How many people um, died because they lost access to clean water, um, to food, uh, because they weren't able to get child? I mean, there's all, right? So what does that mean? So when we think about, like, we're saying citational practices, but when you think about the lens through which you view the world or your way of seeing, that number can be quite elastic, right? So what does it mean to die from a catastrophic environmental um, moment? On the, uh, the other side of your question was, how do we respond to this objectification of the black body, right? So what, something I'm thinking of a lot is the black body in distress. So we've seen, um, for instance, Serena Williams, right, with this cartoon that we've had. And what does that mean? That these, we have these tropes, these ever-ready tropes. So we know what that means to see a big black woman angry, right? So that's like an instant call-up. So we know that the black body is already objectified, right? But there's also... The flip side to me is the power of that spectacle. So it is being made light of in a cartoon, but also some of the work I've seen in the Black Lives Matter movement of doing a die-in, right? Of saying, we are aware of how we operate and the spectacular nature of our body in history and in the, in the United States and the world today. Come look, right? That this is this happens all the time. This face what you have done, face these processes, be confronted with, um, be confronted with the ways that we live our, our lives and be confronted with the ways that our bodies are always already positioned, right? So I think that there's a power there, but it's, I mean, it's a slippery slope and it can be dangerous, but I do think um, that it's a, it's a really interesting question. Thank you. So I'll address quickly the um, idea of death by also invoking Orlando Patterson's work on social death and considering the ways, right, that there's representational death at work here in relationship to black and indigenous bodies in front of the law. And I think that work is sometimes lost um, in the kind of genealogy of the term social death. We have to kind of go back to, to some of that kind of understanding. Um, I think there's also embedded in your question something about the appropriation and the ways in which sometimes spectacles of disaster or death actually put, you know, um, certain scholars are at the forefront of writing about that or journalistic approaches, et cetera. And I do want to acknowledge that. That's why I included, and maybe this goes a little bit to the question about the extractive view, in my comments about what that looks like, the kind of question of the university as also extracting labor from these communities and even our own research as being um, hopefully conscious in a, a collaborative process that ends up being less extractive. And, and, but that's a very 
complicated set of, um, of methods, practices, and intentions, I think, that actually are really, really important to piece out. Um, by the extractive view, I was really referring to a dominant viewpoint, um, a way of which, you know, the planetary has been mapped by the digital, and it's been mapped to show hotspots in resource pools over Iraq, over Afghanistan. If you look at the history of war, that's what I was saying in my concluding comments, that it's not surprising to find that, you know, those are the resource-rich sites, right? Um, if you have resources like Nigeria, watch out, right? You're gonna have this, this kind of paradigm of war in, op in operation. So really to say that there's a universal kind of language there that objectifies. And so the submerged perspective is trying to theoretically counteract that. So I'm really, I found in my own work that I was at a limits with cultural studies, with interdisciplinary vocabularies, and really had to create a new conceptual language for this book. And I, you know, a lot of poetics work really informed that, but then taking that and taking it a step further, again, drawing upon the people I was working with and their languaging of things, and then just finding other ways to say things, because I think language is meaningful, and also we fall into the reductive um, uh, extractive zone as well with language, right? Um, and then lastly, I would just say that I, I think there's a lot of really interesting groups that are exposing the extractive view from Latin America, from the Americas. One is called Yasuni ITT. They do a really amazing project where they show how actually corporations map out these blocks of territory according to oil drilling practices and then do not interlink those territories precisely so that infrastructure can be built, for instance, in zones of conservation by indigenous peoples. And so that's when roads are opened anew um, and, you know, the bulldozers move in. And if you've read my work, you know I'm obsessed with the bulldozer. I think it's like the, um, you know, phallic machinery of, of the Anthropocene, to put it that way. And I, you know, I think that there's ways in which there's a lot of work being done on the ground, innovating and technology that looks back against these kind of military technologies, uses them and repurposes them, right, in really exciting ways. Um, so, I don't know if there was anything else. Any other burning questions? Did we answer? Oh, the question of generation. I'll leave that. I have things to say, you but no. Start. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> so I will say that um, when I talk about youth organizing, I don't mean that they're somehow disconnected from the communities in which they reside or the relationships they have to history. In many ways, his, history is the present and the future for them. So they're thinking about organizing with a sense of what their communities have been through, how colonization and occupation and, and conquest have in the past and in the present and also looking towards the future are, you know, um, implicated in their lives in really profound ways. So I have actually seen a lot of intergenerational kinds of um, conversations and people think about organizing, again, I will say like, and this is something I feel like I've learned tremendously over like the past X number of years working closely with um, indigenous communities and peoples um, is that it's relationships are key and sets of relations are key. And so this factors into the way indigenous young people think about how they do their organizing work. I wouldn't say that they're, I've never encountered sort of, um, you know, spaces of contestation, but that there is a kind of intergenerational connection around these things that I think is really important. And I mean, I can say more, much more about this spe specifically with respect to Standing Rock, but I'll stop there. the possibility of the apocalypse has already happened. So I'm thinking about this question of intergenerational dialogue or, or the set of relations, not so much in terms of the individual, but in terms of the worldview and set of experiences. So what does it mean that the apocalypse has already happened? So for instance, I'm working on finance capital, which I'm looking at a really quintessentially neoliberal program, tax holiday in the Caribbean. But the way it's received by folks on the ground, by my interlocutors, they clearly articulate it as slavery. They're saying, 
I know what this looks like. I know what wealthy white people coming here and getting richer and using our labor in ways that are convenient to them and then leaving. I know what that is and that's slavery, right? And so my work is pushing back and saying this is an alternate framing to think about citational practices. This isn't madness or a, a, an inability to apprehend the laws of economics, right? It's an alternate framing and thinking about Certainly they weren't, they weren't enslaved on an individual level, but they have this worldview that is deeply informed by their the dispossession of their ancestors, which they continue to live in the present moment as a colony of the United States. So what does it mean to live and move with that embodied knowledge, right? That this has happened to us, or some version of this has happened to our community in the past. How do we now move with this new set of possibilities, limits, Right? I think that the past continues um, and the things people have been through continue to inform the way that they react to things that come up in the current moment. Um, an honor to be in dialogue with the two of you. I've enjoyed myself immensely, and I do think there is something to embody dialogue and exchange um, that online forums can kind of begin to get at, but certainly this kind of interaction. So thank you for joining me. Thank you all for being here tonight.